So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the map seminar. Uh, first of all, yeah, I should take responsibility for yesterday. Yeah, it was uh, my messing up different time zones, even though I live in this one. But anyway, it's uh, luckily Jeff could speak uh, today uh, on very short notice. Well, and uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce him. He is a professor in Rutgers and he did his PhD in Ohio State University on the Rai Chaud Huri. And he works Ray, in many- Ray Chaudhry. Sorry? Ray Chaudhry. Ray Chaudhry. Did I, did something, it, something like okay. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and he works in many areas and proves beautiful results. And for his work, he received a polio prize and also his fellow of American Mass Society. And in 2012, with Van Wu and Anders Johansson, he received Falkerson Prize for their beautiful results on thresholds for tilings by small graph. And I guess today he will present some very beautiful proofs recently, which prove this results, or not this result, but in this area, in this piece graph. Oh, yeah. ah, it might not be what you expect. <laughs> so, um, all right. The, uh, Let's see. Yeah, I should I should warn you that this was the so these slides you can start looking at um, were are, are prepared for a an eighty minute colloquium tour. So you will see me skipping some things. I, I think there are things. I hope there are things that I can skip here that I couldn't skip in the colloquium. But you can stop me, um, and you should just keep feeling how lucky you are that it's that it's only fifty minutes. Um, so. We, it will go pretty fast at the beginning, but but again, slow me down if necessary. Uh, we will work in this this general setup. So x is a finite set. Um, two to the x is a power set. Mu p is the the natural coin flipping measure. So you you choose a random set by including every element with probability p, and and these are independent choices. Uh, sometimes oh, I can write on these slides, can't I? So sometimes. Uh, we use XP for the, the random set you get that way, not so often. Um, the, uh, the canonical example is that X is all the pairs from one up to N. And then this is the ordinary random graph, all right. Uh, we will look at families of sets. So uh, again, F will be a family or uh, we call it a property. It's a collection of subsets of X. Um, it will just about always be increasing, which means if, you, if you're if you in F and, and you add some elements, you're still in F. And you see, so you see a picture, uh, if, if it's helpful, you see a couple uh, graphic examples at the bottom. So containing a copy of a particular graph is an increasing property. Um, being connected is an increasing property. Um, you know, when I say being connected, notice that the, the vertex set in this case is always n. So only the edges are, are in question. So connecting means you connect everything. Um, a more interesting property uh, is, is the Ramsey property. Um, sorry, the, every once in a while this doesn't work, but um, so uh, the simplest version would be I, anytime you two color the edges of your graph, red and blue, uh, one of the colors contains a copy of, of the complete graph on, say, T vertices. Um, and again, this is increasing because if, if I give you if I give you some extra edges, you don't have to use them. All right, uh, these, for what it's worth, these are all graph properties, meaning they are invariant. Um, they don't depend on how the vertices are labeled. They're a function of isomorphism. Uh, let's see. Um, Oh, we at, so sometimes you will see at the top of the slide little things in braces. This is because it's not a blackboard talk, and I try to guess what you might wish to look back for on the previous board. Um, if f is increasing, uh, and we're we're working with this coin flipping measure, we're interested in the probability of landing at f. Um, that's an increasing function of p. This actually requires a proof. If you've never seen this, you should sit down and try. This is important, but it looks completely obvious. Nobody has ever complained about it. All right, so again, 
if, if I come down and graph, again, I graph against P, the probability that you land an F, this is increasing in P, except in two stupid cases, which you can figure out, it's strictly increasing. And so there is exactly one P for which it's a half, and that's the threshold, right? So for this talk, the threshold is, is just that P for which mu P of F is a half, all right? Uh, you know, stop me if there are questions, otherwise I just keep barreling ahead. Um, the, uh, so this is, if you're familiar with the, the erdos renyi notion, which is where this whole subject starts, um, let me skip this slide and just say, for our purposes, erdos renyi threshold means the order of magnitude of what I'm calling the threshold. So I, I only want it up to constants. And this was, this was their definition. And, and sometimes you're delighted if you can get, if you can pin the thing down to within the order of magnitude, sometimes you hope to do better. Um, and uh, I think, let me just jump down to the last line of the slide. This is in the background of just about everything that I say is this question of what, what pushes up the threshold? What, what do you have to, you know, what, what forces PC? I, I never said it, but PC is the notation for the threshold. What forces this to be large? What's pushing this up, all right? Uh, okay, so we'll play with this a little. The uh, discussions of this thing pretty much always start like this. I say, what's the probability that you contain a particular graph H. So let's look at the threshold for that property, right? Um, and the answer here is the expectation is what drives the threshold. So you can see it, but I, I figure this is probably familiar. If I, if I take Y to be the number of copies, I can calculate the expected value of Y, which more or less is N to the four P to the five, right? Uh, which says that the threshold had better be at least n to the minus four p to the, what did I say? At least n to the minus four over phi, and n to the minus four fifth. Um, because below that, even the expected number of copies is small, so you're not gonna see one. All right, and, and then you have to prove this is right. This is the answer, all right? So that's the order of magnitude of the threshold. Uh, the, the next, story one would tell would come to this slightly more interesting graph K, uh, where you could do the same calculation. It would tell you that the threshold is at least n to the minus five sixths, right? Because the expectation is, is n to the five to the six. And this is, this is a, well, it's not wrong, it's, it's true, but it's not the answer, right? The answer is, is n to the minus four fifths again, because the, the hard part of containing this graph K, I'm in the middle of the page, is containing our earlier graph H, right? So that's the part that pushes up the threshold. And it turns out that this is the answer. Don't, don't read any of this. Um, it turns out that that's the answer in general. All right, so if I am fixing, and this is, this is important, though, let's emphasize, we are fixing the graph H, all right? And then every subgraph will give you a lower bound on the threshold because you need to, the expected number of copies of any subgraph must be reasonably large. And so you get a bunch of lower bounds. You take the biggest of them. And that is the, that's the truth. Um, so, so this is easy. Uh, occasionally I'll, Give little, I'll try to give little hints about what's involved in some of these proofs. This one is you look at the variance, I don't want to talk about it. But all right, so that's the end of this first little item. Again, you feel free to do that. Okay, if not, we move to something more interesting. I emphasize once again, this was, this was fixed graphs. So now we move to an unfixed graph. All right, and now here the prototype is a perfect match. Uh, let's see, if, if I say perfect, if you hear me talking about, for example, a perfect matching, then N is even, I'm not gonna say it every time, all right? Uh, so what's the threshold for a perfect matching? If you go through expectations again, so, so 
when age was fixed, expectations were really the whole story. That's what, what pushed the threshold up. Here, it's not true. Okay. So if you look at expectations, what you will get out of it is that the threshold is, is on the order of at least one over n, at least on the order of one over n. But that's no longer the answer. The answer is, is that it's like log n over n. Um, and what happens, so what pushes the threshold in this case is isolated verts. Right, and this, this now comes to one of the, the central themes of, of this talk. Uh, so if, if you want a perfect matching, you must cover the vertices, right? That happens when P is around log N over N, or, or, or to say it a different way, it happens when you have collected about N log N edges, okay? And what I want to say is, uh, what I want to emphasize is th this is a coupon collector. All right, so coupon collector, I, I, I assume it's familiar, but I'll say it quickly. You had n coupons, you keep getting random, every day you get a random coupon. How many days do you wait to get a full set of coupons? The answer is n log n, typically. All right, and so here, uh, the vertices are the coupons. We're, we're collecting them two at a time. This turns out not to be important. Okay, and, and so again, they will disappear right around natural log of n over n. And, and so one may guess, now you still have to prove. What I have told you is that if p is much less than log over n, if p is much less than log n over n, you have no chance. You're not gonna have a perfect matching because you're not gonna cover the vertices. When you do cover the vertices, you, you, this still requires a proof. It's not so hard. Um, and we know more precise things. So for example, remember my threshold is a particular value. It's not an order of magnitude. And uh, we know asymptotically what that value is. So the, the twiddle, I will say this, although I'm sure you know, it means the ratio of the two sides tends to one. So the threshold is, is asymptotically natural log of n. Notice that now I have to say which log I'm talking about. The threshold is natural log of n over n asymptotically. That's one precise version of, of, we, of, of this intuition that isolated vertices are the issue, but you have a literal version of that, right? So this is the definitive result. It's called the hitting time version. And it says, let's, let's change them up. Let's, let's start with vertices, no edges, vertices. And we'll start throwing edges at random in the obvious naive way. And we will stop as soon as the vertices are covered, right? And the theorem is that then you almost certainly do have a perfect match. So you, you almost certainly have a perfect matching at the first instant when you conceivably could. Uh, and this says that isolated vertices are, are the issue in a completely literal sense. They are the obstruction in the random setting. Um, okay, uh, let me, say here, this, this might just come up a little bit later. Um, the key here, these are easy reasons. Not, these are homework problems, but hard homework problems. The key is touch, all right? So touch says there are all these trivially necessary conditions for a perfect matching. And the amazing fact is that if you satisfy them all, then you do have a perfect matching. So when you wanna prove in, in whatever model we're talking about that you probably have a perfect matching, what you really wind up showing is that you're unlikely to violate any of these trivial necessary conditions. So, okay, and, and now if you've never seen it before, you can go in and try to do it. Um, the, uh, let me go quickly here. Just, this is just to say uh, that this is a, a familiar situation. So in all of the examples, including perfect matchings, the expectation, sorry, the, the, what you can get from expectations in the way of a lower bound differs from the truth by a log n, right? And there's something coupon collector-ish going on there. Um, so you can do, connectivity works exactly like perfect matchings. The, the expectation, I won't say what expectations mean at this moment, but, but if you look at expectation considerations, they say the threshold's at least one over n, constant over n. The truth is log n over n, the issue is just covering vertices. Uh, 
if you go to Hamiltonian cycle, the same story basically. Again, even, even the hitting time version is correct, except now you must add edges until every degree is at least two. And then you, you will almost certainly have a Hamiltonian cycle. Uh, the difference between this result and, and the earlier ones is that the earlier ones were easy and this one is not easy. This was a famous problem left over from, from Erdős and Rényi in 1960. Uh, I don't try to sort out who did what, but the breakthrough is, is Posha in the 70s sometime. Okay. Uh, all right, again, I, so this was, I think, let me see what's next. Nice thing about slides is you don't have to remember what you're talking about. Um, that was all sort of ancient history. We become a little more modern, but stop me if there are questions. Uh, all right, so we're gonna talk about Shamir's problem. Um, so this is actually perfect matching. So, so nothing has changed. Well, one thing has changed. Instead of graphs, I'm gonna look at hypergraphs. So whenever I say hypergraph, whenever I say hypergraph, there's gonna be an R which is fixed, uh, which you can think of as three. Um, and, and we're talking about R uniform hypergraphs, meaning, meaning, meaning edges are R element sets, that's all. And again, so r equals three is fine. It's the usual story. There's this huge jump from, from two to three and uh, there's not much going on between three and three million. They're about the same. Um, okay, so what's the threshold for a perfect matching? Perfect matching means what you would expect. Uh, the, the, this problem shows up first. Uh, there's in the first issue of Combinatorica, there's a, uh, an article by Erdős on the combinatorial problems I would most like to see solved. And this is the last problem in that article. Um, so I, you know, maybe that means that of the problems he would most like to see solved, this is the one he would least like to see solved. But, uh, and, and this, but it quickly became a notorious problem. It's very hard to get anywhere with it. Um, I will skip the history. Uh, and let me jump to what, what I claim is the natural expectation here, which is, is that the situation is exactly the same as for graphs. Isolated vertices are the issue, you know, at whatever level of accuracy you want. So the threshold, if you want the order of magnitude, or if you want the asymptotics of the threshold, or even the hitting time, it should still be true. In this setting, uh, the only difference being that everything that works for graphs, as is familiar, breaks down for hypergraphs. All right. In particular, we don't have cut state, and we're pretty sure there is no such thing as cut state. Uh, I should say, by the way, so I say this is the natural guess, but but there may be some um, some hindsight there because Erdős goes out of his way to say he has no idea what the answer should be to this problem which is a little strange since the answer for graphs is due to him, but uh, all right. Uh, let's see. So, so again, the situation should be that if you, well, the situation is that if you look at expectations, I'm in the lower right-hand corner. If you look at expectations, you get a lower bound on threshold like n to the minus r minus one. The truth should be bigger than that by a lot. So there's this, this gap between them. Okay. Uh, well, motivated especially by this, by, by a few things, but especially by this, um, uh, in 07, Gil Karai and I uh, made the following <laughs> fishy looking conjecture. Um, let me define uh, the, what, what we call, what I will call the expectation threshold of F to be the, the largest of the lower bounds that you can get from, from expectations. Now, you know, you, so you'll notice this is not yet a definition because I don't know what it means by lower bounds from expectation, I'll come to that. But assume for the moment that I have this notion, right? Then the conjecture is that that in the middle of the conjecture, you see this, this expectation threshold, which is a tr kind of trivial lower bound on the threshold. And the conjecture is that it's never off by more than a log factor, right? You'll notice now I wrote log x, x is the ground set, but in all the examples we looked at, um, x was n to some fixed power. So log x and log n are the same thing. Um, 
Okay, that's the conjecture. Let me let me tell you what a lower bound from expectation is. Uh, so you'll notice the, the only place in this talk where you'll see a family of sets that is not increasing is right here with the script G, uh, but then we immediately make it increasing. So Poiphy brackets G means the, the increasing family of the general. So all, all the things that contain members of G. Uh, let's see. Um, so here's a, a sufficient condition for P to be a lower bound on the threshold. Now, you know, sometimes this, this condition doesn't exist, but when it exists, P is a lower bound. So the condition is that you can find a G, right? Collection of subsets that does the following two things, right? Um, the first thing is, well, if you read A, it says this funny notation, but, but all it says is every member of F contains a member of G, right? Uh, and then the, the second condition you can read, but I'll tell you what it says. If, if you look at a particular set S, any set S, then, then P to the S is the probability that, that your random set contains S. So, so what you're looking at, when you look at the sum, you are seeing the expected number of sets in G contained in your random set. Expect the number of members of G that are contained in my random set. Okay, so what uh, I don't think I need this line right now, but jump to the bottom. Um, so I again, I've, I've got this expression that that shows up in B, um, and what I promise you is that it's it's at most a half. That's that's condition B. But what I've also promised you is that every time you land in F you do contain a member of G. So the probability that you contain, a, sorry, the expected number of, of members of G that you contain is at least the probability that you land in F. So it's at most a half, it's at least the probability you land in F. That's, you read the left and right hand sides of, of the inequality at the bottom of the screen, bottom of the screen. And that says P is a lower bound on the threshold. Right, mu P of F is less than a half, meaning P is below the threshold. Okay. Uh, anyway, so whatever that condition was, um, we have this conjecture. As I said, it was motivated especially by Shamir, uh, which, which, so the, the guess that the threshold is like log n over whatever it was, it was n to the r minus one, it follows instantly from this conjecture. What you have to prove now is, is Again, you see the conjecture at the top of the screen. So I just have to prove the appropriate upper bound on the expectation threshold, but this, this is very easy. There's a, there's a couple sentences. So, so Shamir comes immediately from this. Uh, there, another thing which I was calling the tree conjecture, it's an awful name, but this is another mid nineties problem, which has to do with containing thresholds for containing spanning trees and random graphs. Let me skip it. Um, so these were kind of two of the more notorious problems in this area at the time of our conjecture. Uh, and you know, if you, if you have two of the more notorious problems in, in an area and they're both instant consequences of this conjecture, any sensible person would say, well, there's an obvious explanation for this, namely the conjecture is wrong. Uh, and that is what we thought. And, and down here is what we said but we conjectured it anyway. Um, and it's, it's still, all right, uh, let's see. It's often sharp, I, I've been talking about that. So let me, let me skip that. Um, it's not always sharp. Uh, you'll know it wasn't sharp for the silly examples we started with of containing a fixed graph. Uh, a more interesting example is, is these Ramsey properties. I'll come back to this in a moment, so I'm not gonna dwell on it now, but, but in Ramsey, uh, in these Ramsey questions I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it turns out there's no gap. The, this is very non-obvious, but that's the answer. Um, and the last thing I wanna say here is what we always want and what we still want, but, but I have no idea how to, how to formulate this, is that anytime there's any gap at all, 
it is attributable to some kind of underlying coupon collector phenomenon. All right, so we've seen that a little bit. We'll see it again in a little while. Um, again, I don't even know how to make this concrete conjecture, but that's that's the feeling. Uh, let's see. What else? I can hardly wait to see what I wanted to talk about next. Um, the yeah, th this is this is one slide of of babbling about. How, do, how does one approach this conjecture? And, and then there'll be another such slide. Um, what seems to be hard is how do you, how do you get your hands on G, right? So uh, think of it this way. Think of it, I've given you the threshold. So if I, I tell you the threshold and your job is to prove that the expectation threshold is not much less, okay? Um, so, Pushing up the expectation threshold, again, you, you see the definition at the top. I know you don't have time to read it, but to, to prove lower bounds on the expectation threshold, I need to show you a G. Well, how do you get your hands on G? And this turns out to be very hard to understand. Uh, you can do it for the, the simple examples we started with. The, you know, as you'd expect, if your property is contained, the funny graph K that you see here. Naively, you might say, I'll take G to be copies of K, but the answer is you should take it to be copies of that, that smaller four vertex step. All right, but this is baby stuff. This is, this is an easy example. Uh, if you go to the Ramsey question, all right? So let me, let me mumble for a minute or two about just the simplest case of the Ramsey question, uh, even for triangles. So, so the property is you color the edges red and blue, one of the colors should contain a triangle. Uh, the threshold turns out to be n to the minus a half. You see it down at the bottom. Um, at least intuitively, this, this might make a little bit of sense because n to the minus a half is where edges start to be in triangles. All right, if p is much less than n to the minus a half, most edges aren't even in triangles. But once you get bigger than n to the minus a half, they are. Um, what should I say? Uh, it's a, a funny thing about as I so these the I should say the Ramsey property prop, prop properties thresholds were all resolved by a few celebrated papers of Revel and Chinsky in the 90s. Um, in this situation, it turns out that uh, the threshold is n to the minus a half, and the expectation threshold is also n to the minus a half, up to constants, right? Um, this is a, a rare situation in that <clears throat> the lower bound is not obvious. Usually, usually the lower bound is clear and, and we're proving the upper bound here. Neither is obvious. Um, and if you go in and look at the proof, so they're not thinking of the expectation threshold that didn't exist at that time. But if you go through what they're doing, or actually there's a, a a nicer argument of Nanadov and Steger more recently, but at any rate, if you read one of these proofs, you can extract from it a, a lower bound on the expectation threshold. And it, it turns out, as I said, that it's the same as the ordinary threshold. Okay, but it's completely unclear. You're, so you're, you're producing a G, but the G is incomprehensible. All right. Uh, so that's already hard, and that's still a concrete example. And the truth is, now I'm down at the last line. I'm not even telling you what the family is. I'm just telling you F. It's some abstract increasing family. So how do you get your hands on G? Uh, there was originally some thought of getting this out of the Fourier transform. Uh, so some of you will know this famous uh, the actually PhD thesis of Ehud Friedwood which in somewhat in, in a somewhat analogous situation gets uh, G from the Fourier transform. I, I won't say more than that. This, at, at this time, this seems to be a dead end. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. But that was the only idea we ever had for producing G. Um, okay. Uh, one more slide on how can we attack this thing. They actually, the second item I've already discussed. So you start from PC, you try to pull the expectation threshold up, you run into this 
question of what, what is cheap. Well, there's another way you could start. You could say, here I have an upper bound, here I have the expectation threshold. So let's say I, the expectation threshold is P and now I wanna prove an upper bound on the actual threshold. I wanna show the actual threshold is not bigger than the expectation threshold by more than a lot, okay? So, so what do you do? Well, you say, what you have to say is if Q is bigger than P, if Q is bigger than the ex expectation threshold, what that means there's no G. All I wanna say on this slide is, is the little thing in the middle. Your hypothesis is that for Q bigger than P, there is no G. How do you use non-existence of G? You, you can go and think about this, but take my word for it. <laughs> this is not a usable hypothesis. So again, where how do you attack this conjecture? All right, um, one more word on this. Uh, in 2010, uh, Michelle Talegrand suggested relaxing the conjecture to a sort of fractional version. All right, so, so what does that mean? Um, we, we said, <clears throat> what we said for, for the original conjecture is you have a bunch of lower bounds that you get from expectation, namely P is a lower bound if there is an associated family G. So now we will look for a fractional G, right? And this is, I, I won't say it, but it's familiar, right? G is a family of sets. So it's a zero one function. It's the, the indicator of G is a zero one function. Uh, so you can relax that to a fractional G, a real value G, okay? And then you can say that P is a lower bound if it admits a fractional G. Now that's, that's a more general class of Gs. So the, uh, the, the class of lower bounds grows and we take the, uh, let me put a circle around it in this case. We, we take the fractional expectation threshold to be the largest of those lower bounds. So that's a bigger class of lower bounds. So, so the fractional expectation threshold sits, excuse me, somewhere between the expectation threshold and the ordinary threshold. And then Talegrand's conjecture is it's the same conjecture. All you do is put a star on it, right? So um, the, the ordinary threshold is no more than fractional expectation threshold times log. Uh, the amazing thing is, or maybe not amazing, as far as we know, this has exactly the same consequences as the original conjecture. All right, it, it, at least every, con every consequence we know follows just as easily here. Um, the, the reason being simply, if you go back to the original conjecture, if, if I wanna use the conjecture at the top of the page, I said this, what I need to do is prove an upper bound on expectation threshold. But it turns out that every, in every instance where we know how to prove an upper bound on the expectation threshold, we are actually proving an upper bound on the threshold. On the, on the fractional expectation threshold. Um, all right, so again, for, for the purpose of applications, the two conjectures are just, the, the weaker conjecture is just as good as the stronger. Um, but now coming down to the bottom of the page, Talegram proposes another conjecture, which, which would say that there's a good reason why these conjectures have the same consequence, consequences. Um, namely, uh, they are the same conjecture. So he conjectures that in fact, fractional expectation threshold, the expectation threshold never differ by more than some fixed factor. Right. This is a beautiful conjecture. It, it's kind of, for, the, for our purposes today, it's sort of tangential, but, but it's a beautiful conjecture because it, it says here's, you know, people spend their lives studying the difference between fractional and integer. And it's saying that here's this huge class, huge natural class of situations where there's really not much difference. Well, all right, um, let's see. Let us, so again, this is, in a way, still history. Um, you can ask questions, it's a good time to ask questions. If not, we start to talk about results. Um, 
Okay. Uh, so actually, as Oleg already <laughs> kindly mentioned, um, in uh, 2008, Antos Johansson von Bu and I proved, uh, well, we, we settled Shamir's problem at the level of erdos Rennie threshold. So the threat, <clears throat> again, the, the intuition was that isolated vertices are the issue. And at the level of erdos Rennie, meaning <clears throat> order of magnitude of threshold, that is right. Um, we also handle, I'll say graph factors, it's, it's just as good for hypergraph factors. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, it, mean, it means this. Uh, let, let me say it for triangle. So a triangle factor is, is n over three distorted products. All right, and h factor is, a, a dis, is disjoint copies of h covering the vertices. Um, for triangle factors, the threshold is the nasty expression that you see on line minus three. All right. Uh, if you don't like these expressions, you should always just remember that they mean something. So what you need, a, a, a prerequisite for a triangle factor is that every vertex should be in a triangle. And this is where that happens. Okay, so this is a coupon collecting problem. Again, vertices are the coupons. Collecting the vertex means finding a triangle containing the vertex. Uh, Okay, so so again, there's this 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 dream that there's always a coupon collector in there. In this case, there is a gap, but the gap is no longer log; it's it's something smaller. But again, it's it's attributable to some coupon collectors thing. Um, okay, so so Shamir, which is one of our main motivations for my conjecture with Gill, was settled in 08. In in just a few years ago, Richard Montgomery in this this is. You reserve the, the term tour de force for results like this. This is something like 100 pages in advances in mathematics. Whatever this tree conjecture was, he proved it. So this, this is an amazing piece of work. Um, so the two original motivating problems were settled eventually. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to tell you, OK, one cannot talk about the proof. And this is Johansson and me and Vu. Uh, it's very hard to talk about this proof, but but let me tell you how it starts. Because th this is already strange. Um, we'll, instead of choosing, the stuff at the top is minor. I'm gonna, instead of choosing edges independently, I'll tell you, I'm gonna choose exactly M of them, and then I'll choose uniformly from the collections of R sets of size M. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll start with all of the sets, so that's called H0, it's just all the R sets. And I'll, I'll just randomly delete until I get down the, you see the blue thing at the bottom, I'll, I'll keep randomly deleting until I get down to M, right? Which is, I wanna claim this is an odd thing to do because I'm starting with something like N to the R sets and I'm throwing away almost all of them. It sounds much easier to start from the bottom and start adding them, but what, what this allows you to do is to sort of keep track of the number of perfect matchings at each step. So phi is notation for number of perfect matchings. Uh, and somehow you track it and you show the thing at the bottom of the slide. You, you show that with very high probability at every step in the process, you have about the right number of perfect matching. It's the, the, this thing, w, that's just what it should be meaning expectation, all right? Uh, and you'll notice I'm giving away an exponential factor, which, which you might think doesn't sound like a minor term, but it turns out to be a minor term. Anyway, what, what I'm not telling you is why, it, and, and this would be starting to actually prove the thing, which I can't do, why it helps to maintain this, what, what advantage that gives you, but, but that's what the, what the proof is about. Um, okay, so that's just a word on this. Uh, at any rate, the, um, so this sort of, so we have Shamir at the level of Erdős Rennie, which sort of vindicates this, this intuition that um, isolated vertices are the issue, right? But, but it, it sort of vindicates because isolated vertices disappear when the average degree is about log n, natural log n, 
And then we say that when the average degree is at least um, a zillion times log n, where a zillion is your favorite constant, but it's something incomprehensible, uh, when the average degree is a zillion log n, then you get a perfect matching. So it's it's only sort of a vindication. And, and since that time, the, the question was, the challenge was, can you give a more uh, um, convincing vindication? And we already know the flavors, right? So one flavor would be to get the asymptotics of the threshold rather than just the order of magnitude. And then the, the ultimate would be to get the hidden color. Right? And this is so first new pair of results, uh, they're not so new, but they're relevant, are these. So these, these two goals are now accomplished. Um, I don't think you need to read the red stuff, but, but the asymptotic version is right. So, so when the average, if, if you're talking about a fixed R, when the average degree is right around log N over N, you will get a perfect matching. Um, and, and even the hitting time version is right. Uh, I will say that contrary to my expectations, I, so people, this seems to have been considered out of reach, the first one, and nobody was even talking about this one. Um, I, I actually always thought the first one should be doable. I mean, I, for 10 years, I couldn't do it, but I thought it should be doable. I thought the second one was hopeless, not even something one should try. But it turns out that the first one is the hard part. That's, that's the big step. Um, that, that is what I'll say about that. Uh, you can ask about factors. Remember, we talked about triangle factors and so on. Um, I will say, but this, this is sort of a religious belief. Yeah, I, I bet you can do that. Um, along the same lines, it will in, involve some additional technicalities. It will be a very long story. Uh, if you want to do it, go ahead, because I'm not going to. But I, I believe it could be done. However, let me tell you something very beautiful due to Oliver Reardon, Annika Heckel. These are two separate contributions. Uh, I won't sort out who did what. Um, but what they say is that in some situations, you can couple Shamir with the graph factor situation and, and get done that way. So for in, just for instance, if you want a clique factor, if you want cliques of size R, so you want to, you want to partition the vertices into cliques of size R, uh, if you know the R version of Shamir, then you also know the clique factor. Uh, I didn't say that very well. If, if you know the threshold for Shamir, for, for value R, then you know the threshold for clique factor, for, for, for R cliques. Um, and that is true at the original erdos renyi level. It is also true at the level of asymptotics. So we actually know the asymptotics of the threshold for a triangle factor, for example. Uh, it is almost certainly not true for the hitting time. I, I don't see any, any possibility of, of looking at what these guys do and, and getting the hitting time version out of that. All right, so for that, you, if you really wanted to do it, you have to go back to what I did for Shamir. Um, Okay, let's see. I always I keep saying the same thing. Stop me if there are questions. Uh, let me see how I'm doing on, what do I got like? How much more time? Not much. Maybe a five, 10 minutes. Oh, you're cheating me. We started late. You will give me at least eight more minutes, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, could, have been eight, could have been 80, so don't complain. Um, all right. Uh, I want the, all right, so the, the plan here was, well, let me try. Um, I wanted to give you like a page about the proofs of, you know, both of these are very long stories. The, the, the asymptotic's not so long, the other one is longer. Um, let me give you one sentence about the asymptotic version, but, you know, so one sentence means one long sentence preceded by some other sentences, but, but still it's a sentence. Uh, so if you, Give me a hypergraph H, I'm on line four, right? If you give me a hypergraph H, I will assign weight to the R sets. The weight of an R set is just, if you delete the vertices in that R set, it's the number of perfect matchings in what's left. So for example, if, if this thing A had been an edge, then this is the number of perfect matchings containing A. 
but the weight doesn't care whether A is an edge or not. Okay, so with that definition, here's the sentence, right? If you, if you take any of the hypergraphs that you are producing in this sequence as you move down, um, you are very unlikely to see all of the following three things, right? The first one, don't worry about it. It says there are a lot of perfect matches. The contrast is between the other two things. So the other two say this, there is some value phi star, it doesn't matter what it is for this discussion, right? And almost every edge of your hypergraph has weight right around phi star. But a decent fraction of the R sets at large do not do that, they have weights different, from, considerably different from phi star. Right, and now the question is, how can this how can this be? So I'm saying this is very unlikely. Well, you know, the hypergraph defines weights for all R sets. Okay, so now I've got all these weights, and now I'm choosing, I'm deciding which which R sets are edges and which are not. And somehow, even though lots of R sets have the wrong weight, when I choose randomly which R sets are edges, I keep choosing sets with the right weight, and this should be very unlikely. Now, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to fool you. This is nonsense, as you realize, because you don't know the weights until you choose the edges. But this is the intuition. And I will tell you, this, this, these, this sentence at the bottom of the page is the heart of the whole argument. That is, that is the thing that I was held up on for uh, something like a decade. Um, yeah, so it, it turns out to be right. It, and it, it makes sense, but it's not so easy to prove. Um, but uh, the idea here, I, I hope to give you a little bit of a flavor of something, some ingredient in this proof. Uh, let me jump to the uh, the hitting time version there. This is very quick. Two things to say. First of all, you should immediately recognize that I claim I'm following the same framework where I'm coming down from the top. And you should recognize this is entirely incompatible with proving a hitting time version where you're coming up from the bottom. And it is, you can't do this as far as I know. Uh, it turns out what you wind up doing instead is going back to the asymptotic version and you basically are doing the same thing. So I'm looking at the last couple lines on the slide. I'm choosing this, this H and M, which is just the M random R sets for a suitable M, but I am going to condition on none of the degrees being too small. Okay, so fix your favorite tiny positive epsilon. And I promise you the degrees are all at least epsilon and log. Right, now we're in a situation where the average degree is log n, natural log n. But in that situation, you will be seeing some tiny degrees normally. And, and this, this conditioning is actually extremely unlikely. That conditioning event is, is a wild unlikely event, which makes it very hard to work with. Uh, and then what you wind up doing is, is following the asymptotic proof, but, but it turns out that even things that were a sentence in the old proof turn out to be tricky, turn out to involve strange ideas to, to be made to work in this funny setting. All right, this is what I will say about proofs. We're about, we're about done. Uh, I will kind of, all right, I will more or less finish on time. Um, so we're, we're, finally we come to what Oleg thought I was going to talk about. Um, this is, so many of you will know, in uh, about a year and a half ago, Keith Frankston, Bhargav Narayanan, Jin Young Park, and I proved uh, Talibransky, yeah. right? Um, this was heavily inspired by the, uh, the breakthrough of, of the guys you see all wise at all on the Erdos-Rado sunflower conjecture. Uh, I don't need to tell you what that is. This was for a colloquium, and, and really the only the only point of describing this in the colloquium was, was so that I could say, as you can see, this has nothing to do with what we've been talking about. Um, what will I say about this proof? Number one, it's ridiculously easy. Right, so the paper with Johansson and Vu is tough. Montgomery's proof is insanely tough. Uh, this one's about four pages. For the, the actual proof is maybe four or five pages. Um, 
why why can you this, this is the last slide by the way and, and I can skip the bottom half if necessary but um why can you attack Talegrand's conjecture where you cannot attack the original conjecture with Gill? Uh, the, uh, to no one's surprise, the answer is LP duality. Right. So you will remember, let me say this slowly. Uh, at some point I said, well, how could you attack the, the so-called Khan Kalei conjecture? You could start with the expectation threshold, P, and then you say, if Q is bigger than P, then there is no G. And I said, you can't use that. But now you would say, there is no fractional G. And this you can use, because when I tell you there's no fractional G, I'm telling you some constraint on the optimum of some linear program. So I'm saying, with, with this linear program, you cannot do X. And what that means is that in the dual program, you can do something, right? And it turns out if you do the translation, what you can do is you can assign probabilities to the members of your original family F. So I, again, I can, I can specify some probability measure on F, which is in some way spread out. It doesn't kind of clog up at any particular part of the universe. And, and that's the point that I'm not telling you how to do anything, but I'm telling you that this gives you a place to start. You have something to, rather than saying there's no G and, and I have no idea what to do. I can say there is this probability measure on F and I can start, that's a starting point. Um, you know, now to be clear, this is not news. I mean, I, I and surely many other people knew this 10 years ago, but, but that then it looks like a place to start, but it's hard to see where to go once you have. Um, consequences we've talked about, they, Oh, I, I give you a choice. I can skip the bottom half, which is just things I don't know how to do, or I can talk for two more minutes. Well, it's fine. You can talk, yeah. All right. So, so these are quick. The, the factors, remember, we talked about, for example, triangle factors. Uh, this machine does not handle them as far as we know. It would be nice. All right. Th this is an interesting question. I don't know how to do it, and it looks hard. Um, another one. A, a sort of insanifying question is this. Um, you know, the, the, the old story was if I give you a, a hundred N triples, then the expected number of perfect matchings is huge, but you will not have one because you will have isolated vertices. So let me just legislate away the isolated vertices. I, I work with this different model, which is called K out. Uh, where every vertex picks k edges. Think of k as 100, pick your favorite constant. Every vertex picks k of the edges that contain it. You throw all these edges into a pot, that's your hypergraph. Don't worry about duplicates, that's, not a, that's a minor issue. Uh, and the conjecture is that you then have a perfect match, right? So you, the expected number of perfect matches is enormous. And we have simply promised, we've arranged that there can't, you can't have isolated vertices. So it, it looks very clear that there should be perfect matching. No idea how to do this, right? So if, if I go back to the previous line factors, I don't know how to do it this way, but I do know how to do it. Here, I, we don't know how to do it at all. Uh, for graphs, you see you, a couple papers for reference at the bottom, but for graphs, this is a well understood model. But as usual, as soon as you go to hypergraphs, it, it gets hard and I am going, I am uh, uh, done. So, Thank you, thank you. There should be a thank you. Somewhere. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Nice, nice. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> uh, questions? Yeah, maybe I'll ask a question. So this new machinery you saw the square of Hamiltonian cycle. And I would guess you try to this new machinery or the spread families and so on, uh, randoms. Uh, and you apply I'm them. having trouble hearing you. Uh, so, so this new machinery, uh, which comes from some motivated by sunflower lemma, progress in it. So you, you are able to solve squares of Hamiltonian cycle. 
Right. Did you try hard to reprove triangle factor with this in this way? I, I would say I tried. You, know, you have to define try hard. It's hard. It's hard to try hard and, uh, unless you have some idea. And and basically, yeah, I looked at it a few times, and it just always looked uh, like no chance. I, I couldn't see any any way into it. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I, I'd be really interested to see if you could do that, but I, I don't. I don't know how to start. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions? All right, then let's thank you, Jeff, again. Okay. I guess. Um, yeah.